When I was in a college chaplain, uh, one of my major duties was to spend time with students, pondering the question that obsessed them all. Question, what should I do with my life? It's a fair question for a young adult to be asking. What should I do with my life? That's a question universities were built to answer. Faculty lure students into a abandoning family, their tribe, their neighborhood, puts them through a food court of courses called the curriculum, makes possible for them to waste huge amounts of time with their peers, who frankly know as little about life as they, and then ask them to choose. Now, which courses do I want to take? Even though they lack both the experience and the wisdom to know what they want. Though this pedagogy was previously unthinkable in the history of higher education, the university serves a mobile demanding market by teaching students to ask, what should I do with my life? This is the modern way of growing up. Modernity compels us to write the story that defines who we are, heroically to choose from a variety of possible plots. Well, I've come to believe that asking ourselves, what should I do with my life, is a question that Christians ought not to ask. Because the question is based on a whole set of presuppositions that well, Christians just don't believe are true. For Christians, the proper question throughout life is not, what do I want to do with me? Rather, which God am I worshiping? And how is that God having his way with me? <laughs> One of the most radical countercultural texts in all of Scripture is this one from the Psalms. Psalm 103, uh, uh, verse 3. It, it is God who hath made us, and not we ourselves. None of us is self-made. There's not a person here who's forced to concoct yourself. Huh, what a relief to know that God likes to make things. You don't have to devise yourself from scratch. In fact, it's a lie to think that you can. The best thing about being a Lutheran, explained a young Canadian to me, the best thing is that in baptism, when the church just tells you who you are, I spent my whole life trying to figure out which path to take. <laughs> Look, kid, your whole life consists of only 24 years. You haven't wasted that much time yet. Uh, so at my baptism, the church just doused me and said, hey, here's who God meant you to be. This is the life you were created to live. That is a blessing. That, that we are not self-made implies that we are God's property to be called for, to be utilized as God pleases. Christians don't believe it's possible to make yourself up from scratch because we believe that God not only loves us, but that God calls us. We're talking that, about that wonderful, particularly, peculiarly Christian word, vocation. In the New Testament, calling or vocation refers to discipleship rather than your current employment. Uh, we can be called to eternal life, 1 Timothy 6, or into fellowship with Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, out of darkness into light, 1 Peter 2, 9, into a right relationship with God, Romans 8, 30, but not to a career. Uh, I'm sure, Paul was a tent maker, but nowhere is Paul called to be a tent maker. Tent making, but bread on the table, which is justification enough for Paul to give it his very best. Paul was called to be an apostle. His vocation from God was to spread the good news to the Gentiles, that they were included in the promises of God to Israel. Uh, remember high school career day? At least in my high school, that's when they invited people into the school from the community to talk about their jobs. A nurse, a teacher, a salesperson, a chef, 
would, would be given 10 or 15 minutes to recruit us to the job they were doing. A major question we were urged to ask ourselves in my high school was, well, what am I good at? Uh, what do I enjoy doing? Now those questions are fine to ask, but they're not really the Christian way of vocation. I like working with people, therefore, naturally. Well, that, that's not the way of vocation. How about nursing sick people? No. Oh, uh, we, you'd like to coach an NFL team? Uh-huh. Oh, well, that doesn't appeal. Well, how about advertising? Uh, I've got it. Run for president. Any fool can do that. No, no. Vocation, Christian vocation, is not evoked by your bundle of need and desire, what you want. Vocation is what God wants from you, whereby your life is transformed into a consequence of God's redemption of the world. The talents God gives at birth are nothing compared to the gift of a vocation. I mean, look no farther than Jesus' own disciples. Remarkably mediocre, untalented, lackluster yokels. And you'll see that innate talent or inner yearning, that's got less to do with vocation than God's thing for redeeming lives by assigning us something to do for God. Vocation is not an inclination within awaiting discovery by rooting around in the recesses of your ego or a means of getting what I want out of life. As Jesus said succinctly, hey, you haven't chosen me. I chose you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. John 15, 16. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm going to put that verse up there with it. It, it, it is God who hath made us and not we ourselves. I'm going to put those two verses together as two of the most important countercultural verses in all of Scripture. Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, Hey, don't ever forget, discipleship that is working with me, that was my idea before it was yours. You weren't searching for something fulfilling to do with your life and then you chose me. No, I chose you. Why did I choose you? So that you could have a happier, more fulfilling life? Ah, forget it. I chose you that you might go and bear fruit for me. The God who chose Israel and the church is a sucker for the likes of somebody like me to say nothing of somebody like you. You can look it up. Jesus begins his work not by a solo dive into ministry, but by putting the finger on a dozen knuckleheads and commissioning them to do what he wants done in the world, calling for them in order that they should go and bring forth fruit. Now, I've got all this Christian vocation on my mind because this Sunday's gospel. Right after a frustrating night of failed fishing, Jesus' disciples say, uh, Hey, we've been out here all night and we haven't caught anything. Well, Jesus tells them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat in deeper water. They obey. And when the nets are pulled in, they're bursting with a miraculous catch of fish. And Simon Peter blurts out, Oh, depart from me, Jesus. I'm a sinful man. <laughs> Peter is clearly overcome with awe by the majesty, the glory of Christ. Luke says that James and John were amazed too. <laughs> Note, Jesus doesn't go away from Peter. Rather, Jesus says to this confused, overawed, confessed sinner, Peter, Hey, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be fishing for people. Not leaving Peter in his awe and fear. Not saying one word in response to Simon's confession of faith. Jesus enlists Peter to join with him in his work of outreach to the whole world. And then Luke says, As soon as they brought the boats to the shore, they left 
everything and followed Jesus. <laughs> A miraculous catch of fish is followed by the miracle. Uh, by the way, a miracle is just some surprising act of God. The miracle of calling S Simon to be a disciple. This vocation story is a corrective, I think, for some of the misconceptions about Christian vocation. Maybe you've heard that Jesus' summons is based upon his assessment of your gifts his insight into your hidden talents. No, like Simon, you and I, we're just sinners. Sometimes failures at our day jobs, sometimes overwhelmed by the glory of Jesus. And Jesus' call comes only to people like us. His call is not based upon our potential or our merits. It's based upon His grace. His call to us is His undeserved, unearned gift to us. As Jesus said, hey, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Why? So that you would bear fruit. Uh, so that we produce good works, uh, so that we would produce those good works for Him so that we would bring in a miraculous catch of disciples. Simon didn't make himself a disciple by his decision or his astute assessment of his gifts. He was made a disciple by the work of Christ. It is God who has made us, not we ourselves. And Simon and James and John, they, they leave everything, they follow Jesus. God's got some form of discipleship in mind for everybody here. Therefore, everybody can expect vocation. That peculiar way that God uses you, creation of God, in God's salvation of the world. And one of the happiest aspects of my happy pastoral life is, is getting to watch the ways in which God calls. Some of you to write letters to the incarcerated, others to do time on the church finance committee, or to empty the bedpans of those in need, to raise a couple of godly children, or to set a good table for the hungry, even to be a public school teacher and a Christian at the same time. At an inner city church, Wednesday morning prayer breakfast, which that, that means God in a sausage biscuit at an ungodly hour. Uh, I piously ask the assembled laity, uh, I want you to pray for Mary. Uh, Johnny was booked last night. Yeah, DUI. And, and I'm going to see what I can do to get Johnny out. Uh, boy, Mary's had a hard time with that boy. How much you know about alcoholism, said one of the men unimpressed by my pastoral care. Uh, Where are you going to get the money for the bail? Asked another. Uh, hey, we'll go with you. Hey, uh, take that off the prayer list. We can handle this one. <laughs> well, the three of us walked into the dark bowels of the jail where we saw a frightened youth huddled in the corner of a cell weeping. Son, how long you been in and had a problem with alcohol? One of the men asked through the bars. Uh, I wouldn't say I had a problem, uh, he replied. Uh, I, uh, uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, how long have you been lying about your problem? <laughs> Son, I learned a lot about booze the hard way. I, I had that monkey on my back since I was in the army. I, I can show you the way out. <laughs> We're springing you, said the lawyer. And, and you come home with me, too, afterwards. Uh, our kids are out of the house. Your mama's got enough on her already. And, and I'd love to have somebody to watch Clemson football with. Wow. Vocation in action. 